Is this Christmas? I think it must be Christmas because this is the gift that keeps on giving. Grab your piece of paper, the second upload, let's go. Hello and welcome to MK's medical review series again today, second upload. This is a series on my YouTube channel where we we'll look at medical topics in depth. Today I want to look at a very quick topic, pediatric hypoglycemia. This is, in my opinion, one of the very easiest topics to teach because I simply tell my students, imagine a time when you were hungry. So if you haven't yet subscribed to the channel, please subscribe to the channel, hit the bell notification icon to be receiving notification of such amazing content every time I post. Drop a like, drop a comment to Zambia and beyond. Let's go. Because it's the second video of the day, I do not have any warm-up question for you. I think your brain is already warmed up. So, in this lecture, we're going to be focusing mostly on hypoglycemia in older children and adolescents. The details of neonatal hypoglycemia will be covered in detail in a separate lecture. So when you talk about hypoglycemia, it's pretty much a plasma glucose less than 2.6 millimoles per liter. Well, in some hospitals, actually, we, we use a higher threshold of 3 millimoles per liter, and we do consider severe hypoglycemia as a plasma glucose that's less than 1.5 millimoles per liter. Remember that in the preterm neonates, in the first three days of life, glucose may actually be as low as 1.1 millimoles per liter without actually any underlying abnormality. In term neonates, it may be as low as 1.7 in the first three days, and 2.2 in the remainder of the week. So therefore, anything that's lower than 2.6, we should actually investigate it thoroughly. Causes include infectious versus non-infectious. Infectious causes, intrauterine infections in the very young individuals, the neonates, sepsis due to gram-negative organisms, non-infectious causes, it could be conditions that increase insulin excess, so pretty much an infant of a diabetic mother, it's a transient cause of hypoglycemia, Persistent hyperinsulinemic hypoglycemia of infancy, very long word. So this is going to be resulting from insulin produ producing tumors or islet cell hyperplasia. Then you may have conditions that diminish glucose production or substrate supply. So pretty much your intrauterine growth restriction and prematurity because these conditions are associated with decreased hepatic stores of glycogen and they are also going to be associated with poor ability to synthesize glucose from non-carbohydrate precursors, a process that is referred to as gluconeogenesis. This also is a cause of transient hypoglycemia. You may have perinatal asphyxia, which causes transient hypoglycemia as well, recess incompatibility, inborn errors of metabolism, amino acid or organic acid disorders. You may have disorders of carbohydrate metabolism, such as glycogen storage diseases, fructose intolerance, lactosemia, free fatty acid oxidation defects, urea cycle defects, endocrine disorders like hypopituitarism, growth hormone or adrenal insufficiency, Beckwith Weidemann syndrome where patients are large for gestational age and they present with visceromegaly, hemihypertrophy, macroglossia, umbilical hernias as well as distinctive ear creases. You may have other causes such as drugs, alcohol, aspirin, beta blockers, or it could be ketotic hypoglycemia. Clinical features of hypoglycemia are often going to be accompanied by signs and symptoms of autonomic or adrenergic activation and or neurologic dysfunction, the so-called neuroglycopenia. Autonomic features include tremors, a pounding heart, cold sweat, pallor. Neurological features are going to include difficulty concentrating, blurred vision, disturbed color vision, difficulty hearing, slurred speech, and poor judgment and confusion. You may also have other features such as problems with short-term memory, dizziness and an unsteady gait, loss of consciousness, seizures, death in some cases, and behavioral changes that may encompass irritability, erratic behavior, nightmares, and even inconsolable crying, especially in those individuals that can't even talk, the younger children. Non-specific symptoms that may be associated with either normal, high, or low blood glucose include hunger, headaches, nausea, and tiredness. And remember that in neonates that can't really talk, the bulk majority of them may be asymptomatic or they may present with the following things. They may have non-specific symptoms such as diaphoresis, jitteriness, myoclonic jerks, cyanosis, 
apnea, feeding problems, tachycardia, hypothermia, hypotonia, seizures, and rarely do they have myocardial infarction. Investigations are aimed at assessing the blood glucose level through a serum glucose estimate, a hormone panel that checks for insulin, cortisol, growth hormone, serum lactate in some cases, a lipid profile for free fatty acids and cholesterol, as well as serum ketones, beta-hydroxybutyric acid, acetoacetate, and other organic acids. A full blood count with a differential can be done to pinpoint a focus of infection, as well as urinalysis. Remember that in hypoglycemic states, where you don't have any ketones, it's actually quite important now to look at the free fatty acids. If you get a normal concentration of free fatty acids, this is going to be pointing us towards hyperinsulinism. If there is a raised concentration of free fatty acids, this is going to be indicating fatty acid oxidation defects. Hypoglycemia in the presence of urinary ketones is going to be suggesting a counter-regulatory hormone deficit or a defect in the glycogenolysis, which is the breakdown of glycogen to glucose, and gluconeogenesis, which is the formation of glucose from non-carbohydrate precursors. Management of hypoglycemia includes prompt treatment, so pretty much you want to give an intravenous infusion of 5 ml per kg of 10% dextrose, followed by adequate glucose infusion to maintain the normal blood glucose level to keep the patient euglycemic. So you give them 2.5 ml per kg of 10% dextrose, IV bolus. After the bolus is administered, an infusion of the glucose can be given to maintain the normal hepatic glucose production. Approximately 5 to 8 milligrams per kg per mil in an infant and about 3 to 5 milligrams per kg per mil infusion in older children should be continued. We should adjust this till the plasma level is actually more than 3 millimoles per liter. So in severe hypoglycemia, you may actually administer glucagon as an intramuscular or a subcutaneous injection. Those that are less than 12 years, we give them 0.5 milligrams. Those that are greater than 12 years, we give them 1 milligram. Or you could give it as 10 to 30 micrograms per kg body weight. We should treat the underlying cause. And in neonates, the treatment is directed towards increasing the oral feeding. And if possible, and if necessary, giving intravenous glucose. But we will talk about the details of those in pediatric neonatal hypoglycemia. Here's a schematic of the management of emergency hypoglycemia. So don't give immediate glucose immediately. Think about it. Take a second. Ask yourself, is the blood glucose really less than 3 millimoles or 2.6? Can it be low, normal in severe acute stressors, such as the post-ictophases of certain conditions? Does the patient actually know or have a known cause of the hypoglycemia? Could it be due to insulin? Could it be due to sulfonurias? If they do, is the patient alert? If they are, then give them oral glucose, 15 grams. Check their blood glucose after 10 to 15 minutes, then administer glucose whenever necessary. Then we want to look out for any cause. You may or may not admit this patient. So the age of the patient, their last meal, causes of severe hypoglycemia in diabetic patients could be accidental or intentional, high activity, for example, exertion and even playing around, low food intake, changes in their normal routine or the caretaker, uh, illness, even medication dose changes, then it could be a known metabolic disorder or certain drugs. If the patient is not alert, you want to give them intravenous glucose, that's your 0.25 grams per kg bolus, or your IM glucagon 0.5 to 1 milligram. And we check their glucose in 10 to 15 minutes sooner if there's no clinical response. We maintain them on an IV infusion and follow the same schematic. If this patient does not have any known cause, we pretty much want, and this patient meets one of the, the first, they meet the first two criteria of the Whipple's triad. Whipple's triad is three things. So you have signs and symptoms of hypoglycemia, you have a blood glucose that's less than three, and your, these symptoms usually resolve with treatment. If they do meet the first two criteria, then we generally want to draw blood for certain investigations, five to 10 mils, of blood for glucose estimate, insulin, cortisol, growth hormone, beta hydroxybutyric acid, plus or minus plasma amino acids, or carnitine, plus or minus lactate, or pyruvate. Then we want to also check their urine for any ketones, organic acids, toxicology for aspirin, ethanol, as well as sulfonurias. And we don't just routinely screen them. 
then of course if they are alert we manage them as we have managed on this arm and don't forget to educate the patient reassure them and also start or even change their current treatment and they should also come back for follow-up i really hope you enjoyed this lecture on pediatric hypoglycemia if you did see you in the next video don't forget to hit the subscribe button to zambia and beyond my name is dr moses kazevu until next time bye bye